So first of all, thank you for inviting me to do this. This has been interesting for me to kind of pull some concepts together to talk about. And uh, I very much have enjoyed going through this and working with you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you. I'm going to be focusing on the ACE framework, and my scope is going to be with molecular um, assays. And I've spent the last 18 years trying to fit genetic testing into a clinical chemistry testing laboratory. So um, ARUP is mainly clinical chemistry, microbiology, immunology, and trying to take those concepts and apply them to molecular genetics has been challenging at times. So the one disclaimer I have is that these are my opinions and that, that even within the field you will get some um, disagreement. Um, I've been in other so, uh, it. My thinking has evolved. It is still evolving. So um, a change <laughs> as we understand more. I also wanted to thank um, Heather for for working with me with the BCBSA and and the policies. So um, I was using that as as a framework. But I'm also going to be talking a little bit towards the future, um, even if we're, we may, may not be there quite yet. Um, the other thing that I wanted to comment on is that my background is in inherited diseases. So I have a few slides on molecular oncology, but it is such a different issue that um, I just, I've um, talked with people about bringing people on and, and presenting just on oncology. So even though I have a few slides with it, I'm going to molecular genetics and inherited diseases. So I'm um, that everybody here is, is aware of the ACE framework, analytical and clinical validity, clinical utility, and then the ethical, legal, and social implications. And then the purpose of the tests, which um, actually got the Freiburg um, modifications, is to reduce the morbidity and mortality and to provide information to manage the patient and family members and to assist with um, reproductive decision making. So um, the frameworks, the figure of the frameworks is coming from that paper. All of them have basically the same ideas, although there are some other points that I want to make is that in my mind, there's a difference between a biomarker and a mutation. So when I hear the term biomarker, I think of something that is showing some type of an association and it can give you a relative risk over a general population. These would be, you know, clinical trials or GWAS studies to show an association. They may be gene expression patterns. Um, these are more likely to be proprietary, and, and I will tell you, I don't do many of these in in our own um, genetic tests. And I would say, if you are looking at these types of tests, you'll you need to talk with that um, the laboratory who has has developed that because most of the time they have the information and they may be proprietary. Um, so I'm really talking about mutations or in the ACMG's um, terminology, they've asked us to call them pathogenic variants. So everything is variant and then these would be pathogenic. So most of the testing I do, the vast majority, we're looking for causative mutations. These are mainly Mendelian disorders looking in germline. Now, that some of them will then cross over into the oncology, looking at some of the somatic variants, looking for driver mutations for drug susceptibility or resistance. Uh -oh. um, and just a broad definition for me is, does this assay detect what we claim it detects? We do the accuracy and we do precision studies, and our accuracy determines the analytical sensitivity and specificity. When we look at this, we need to define what regions we're going to look at and interrogate. 
are we going to look at common targeted mutations or are we going to sequence the entire gene? Um, if we do the um. entire gene or possibly we may only want to target a few exons, um, we traditionally look at intron exon boundaries as well as all coding regions. And if we know of a deep intronic mutation or a regular cherry mutation, we can put that in as well. But those are not evaluated all of the time. Some genes have a very high rate of having, a, having deletions or duplications associated with them, mainly deletions. That actually is a different methodology now. Um, but my analytical validity is defined by which regions I interrogate. We know some of the performance characteristics and they're interfering substances. Mainly it's heparin, and heparin um, just, just interferes with PCR. Now we know how to handle it, so if we get a heparin sample in, we need to dilute the DNA and dilute out the heparin um, so it doesn't bind the uh, magnesium in the PCR reaction. But the other ways that the performance is affected is by the, by rare or unknown variants at the primer or probe sites, and some of them may be creating secondary structures. And so we would be getting possibly an allele dropout, meaning that instead of looking at both copies of the gene, we're only looking at one copy of that region of the gene. Or a probe site, if there is a different mutation than what we're looking for, it may show the characteristics of that mutation. and so. There's something there, but it may not be the mutation we're looking for. And so that is what affects our analytical validity. And those are things that we cannot completely control. We'll ever be 100% um, uh, sensitive and 100% 100 per, 100 specific. Uh, the other performance characteristics are if we need to look for mosaicism or low mutation levels. Now, this is very important in oncology. It's not as important in genetics, except for a few genes where we really do need to look for mosaic levels. And at that point, we need to establish what our limit of detection is. Some people use this term as also a, the sensitivity of the assay. Um, I kind of keep the sensitivity, the term sensitivity, I like to keep it to referring to the accuracy and then refer yeah. to the limit of detection to tell you how low of a, you know, what percent of mutation am I going to be able to detect? Um, for, for the most part, uh, the molecular technologies that we use, they all have a very high performance level. Um, it, it is more in the design of the assay than the technology itself. Uh, we all use primer, probe hybridization, sequencing, so these are all very well established and there's a lot of different varieties, but for the most part, they, they pretty much have very, very similar um, accuracy um, and analytical um, characteristics. One other thing about the um, analytical validity is that even once we bring a test online, so it's not in our, um, so beyond our validation of the test, once we bring it online, we have a continual evaluation through uh, the CLIA program um, and the College of American Pathologists to do proficiency testing or some way to assess that we are continuing to get the same type of the analytical performance. Um, I don't think anything there could be controversial, but once we start talking about clinical validity, people define this a bit differently. So again, broadly, I look at clinical validity. Does the test correctly identify affected or unaffected individuals? And my question that I've been talking with people is, is it the analyte or is it the assay that determines clinical validity? In my mind, it would be demonstrating for inherited diseases that, the, that mutations in this gene do cause this disease and then whether you identify them by um, Sanger sequencing or by a uh, targeted mutation or anything else, that validity that this gene mutations really do cause this disease um, 
is is a way to to describe clinical validity. And how do we know that mutations in a gene cause a disease? Well, mainly because of linkage studies with large families, functional analysis, some case control, but truthfully, most of them have been more of cloning the gene. Um, at first, we could clone the gene from a known protein sequence, and then um, we've been able to clone a gene by the genetics, by the family studies, as opposed to knowing the protein. So we can identify even genes when we don't know what the protein is. Again, the clinical validity is going to, to depend on what regions you interrogate, as well as how you define the phenotype. And I wanted to use an example for the F8 gene. Um, and so F8, mutations in the F8 gene um, affect the factor <coughs> um, enzyme, which then causes hemophilia A. The most common severe mutation is um, an inversion of, of a portion of the gene. And so you can't pick up the inversion by sequencing it. <coughs> a different technology to look at that first inversion, and then if that is negative, then you go on to do sequencing and or deletion analysis. Now, um, if you just look at the inversion, the clinical sensitivity of that, we will only pick up maybe about half of the individuals with severe mutations. So the clinical sensitivity for just the inversion test is going to be approximately 50%. If you do the inversion test followed by sequencing um, and then followed by deletion duplication, then the clinical sensitivity for hemophilia A becomes very high. So it's not necessarily the method that you test these with, but it is what you test. Do you test for the inversion? Do you sequence the gene, or are you looking for deletions? Um, and with that said, we also need to define this. Are you talking about what is the clinical sensitivity of this assay detecting individuals affected with hemophilia A? And that's the narrow definition and what I believe should be the definition. If you expand that and say, what is um, the clinical sensitivity of this, to, of this test to detect, to diagnose somebody who has some type of a bleeding disorder? Well, it could be factor nine. It could be von Willebrand. And so therefore, the clinical sensitivity decreases if you use a broader definition of the symptoms rather than the specific disease. So whenever possible, I think we need to define our clinical sensitivities by the, the narrow disease that it is going to be looking for. Um, along with this, um, I've heard and I've seen the use of positive predictive values and negative predictive values. Um, and I'm not quite sure where this fits in. Is it really a measure of analytical validity or is it clinical validity? I would say it probably goes into the clinical validity type measure more than an analytical validity. Or does this really measure clinical utility? Now, with single gene disorders and the mutations that I'm looking for, looking for causative mutations, truthfully, I'm not sure how to use positive predictive values and negative predictive values. Um, as being the, that, to me, the clinical sensitivity um, is the, or the clinical specificity is, is the stronger value. Um, if people have a way how to use this, and I'm, I'm really open and I'm trying to learn this, of how to use these uh, positive and negative predictive values for single gene disorders. Now, there's other times that I do, um, and I understand it. But one of the other uh, questions is that it then becomes dependent on the population. So if I'm using my test for a, to diagnose for affected individuals, it's going to have one positive predictive value or a negative predictive value. If that test goes into a population screening where the vast majority are going to be negative, the specificity may be high, but the or the negative predictive value may increase, but the positive predictive value will go down. And I look at this and say that's the use of the test, but not necessarily the test itself, which is why I am putting the PPV and MPV more into a 
clinical validity or the clinical utility um, a category. Now, there's a lot of complications that happen when we talk about clinical validity. And these concepts that may interfere or may, um, that we need to be aware of when we're talking about this, one is penetrance or expressivity. If we have a highly penetrant allele, then if we identify it in this individual, this individual is going to have symptoms of the disease. Now, if it's a low penetrance allele, then I would see how a positive and a negative predictive value would be more useful for low penetrance um, mutations. Um, but still, most of the things we're looking for are the highly penetrant ones. The expressivity um, will simply tell you the range of symptoms that may be associated with, um, with this mutation or with this gene. Um, there is a clinical overlap between pathogenic variants in multiple genes that cause similar phenotypes. And this is where the laboratory, clinical laboratories, and even the clinicians um, are really embracing the gene panels and to look at multiple genes at the same time um, because it, it, it is um, difficult to do one gene at a time. Um, the phenocopy is also difficult, and it depends on the disease, on the gene. Um, but it, that's if there's other reasons and other things that are causing similar symptoms. So an example of this is the, um, the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. If your phenotype is breast cancer, then mutations in these two are going to be a relative um, small number of individuals with breast cancer that will have mutations. However, if you define it as a hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, then um, our, um, our clinical sensitivity then increases. And I think I have this point in several different slides. So if you see it again, I apologize. And maybe it's just that I want to drive this home. For me, the same test is used for diagnostic, for predictive, and carrier testing. So they have different um, reasons to perform the test. The analytical performance is the same for all of them. I can test all of this but the clinical sensitivities um, are going to be different. Uh, two points that I wanted to make is that there are, um, again, we don't routinely look at deep intronic variants or regulatory variants because most of the time we don't know how to interpret them anyway. So we try to limit ourselves to the regions of the gene where we know that we, can ha we have a good chance of interpreting them. This is the same thing as if there are a gene that's not well understood, and there are studies that are, you know, um, publications coming out now saying this gene has been, um, this mutation has been identified in this gene with this person who has symptoms. That isn't establishing clinical validity for that gene, and so more studies really need to be done before I feel that gene on, um, and 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 uh, testing for that gene. So when we design a panel, we are very careful to make sure that all genes in that panel independently have established clinical validity. One of the things that has been very challenging as we go to gene panels and looking forward is really knowing what are the right genes to put on, which you know which are um, you know, which should be included. And the NIH has a fund has funded a project called ClinGen. And I've been on a, a couple of these working groups, and I really like it because they bring the experts of the field together with the laboratory experts. And we go through the, disease, go through the gene, and um, I'm, I'm hoping, and I guess I have a, a lot of hope, that perhaps this project can come up with, um, with better guidelines for clinicians and laboratories and payers that can use in looking to see what is the right thing to do. So as we go into clinical utility then, um, and I have taken this as a the modified ACE by Freiback and Thornberry, where they've expanded a bit their diagnostic diagnosis into the diagnostic thinking efficacy. And um, with the idea that we do do a number of testing where we're being asked to rule out that there is a differential diagnosis. 
and um, what we can give them back is that we, if we didn't detect the mutation, what is the um, residual chance that this person is still affected? Well, it can be reduced, but we can never take it to zero. Um, one of the, the important aspects of molecular genetic testing is that some, at times we can stop the diagnostic odyssey. Uh, we can stop, prevent additional testing by identifying the, the causative mutation and at that point do the appropriate follow-up and the appropriate monitoring of these patients. And obviously there's the other one such as the therapeutic efficacy is what is the drug response. And then they have called what they say the patient outcome efficacy. So patient management, and does this improve outcomes? And that's all of our goals. Um, but also a prognosis, does it determine aggressiveness of the disease, which could also tell you how aggressively you may um, want to treat. And then with pre predictive, and using this as more of the pre-symptomatic individual, so you know that there is a familial mutation um, and you can identify them before a patient has symptoms or potentially um, as carrier testing in the family, et cetera. Then the last on this slide is the societal efficacy. And I very much like thinking about this because at this point it's the proper use of the resources, either the medical resources or often in genetics we're looking at community resources for individuals um, such as Fragile X syndrome or um, other types of um, um, inherited um, 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 mental, um, mental type diseases where they do need additional schooling aids, etc. And I put this slide in and I didn't take it out because I really do want to um, let you know that I do think showing utility is important and not just to get reimbursed. But I really feel like it's important for us and we work as a laboratory to show and help clinicians in ordering the correct um, test and also how to interpret them and letting them know what this test can and cannot do. And in doing so, I think we can demonstrate the value of genomic medicine in a whole. I, I do um, believe in it and believe that it has um, has a very strong role in in our medicine. Now it's not the end all of everything. There are a lot of other things that are happening other than genomic medicine. Um, but I did want you to know that I that I want to show utility for reasons other than just reimbursement. Now the definition of clinical utility is going to be different for different people. Um, the narrow one that I have heard is. Um, people saying that the only true clinical utility is to determine drug and dose and you have to improve your outcomes. Now this is going to be a very, very narrow um, definition that um, eliminates the importance of it or, or minimizes the importance of a diagnosis. And for inherited diseases, a diagnosis is very important and that there is inherent utility in establishing the diagnosis because without it, you don't know that you're doing the proper treatment or the proper management. And sometimes the diagnosis is such in genetic diseases is it that there is nothing we can do about it. There is no treatment. All we can do is, is potentially help manage the patient. But that's an important piece of information to know as well. Um, it goes beyond this for a family. If you look at a fam the patient in a family, um, genetics really is about families. Once we identify a mutation in an affected individual, we do um, go on and get additional family members that also want to be tested. And truthfully, I do the best job when there is a known pathogenic mutation in the family, and then if the next person doesn't have that mutation, I am um, that's much stronger evidence than me actually sequencing the gene again if there has already been um, a mutation uh, identified. Now for pay payers, they understand that they're looking for treatment and improved outcomes. For regulators, they're wanting to look at the analytical and clinical validity and they are expanding into utility. And again, for society, the efficient use of our healthcare and community resources. So can we get a definition to fit 
all of the above. One of the challenges with establishing clinical utility um, is that, that traditionally it has been randomized prospective controlled studies, or um, if that's not available, retrospective studies with archived samples. These have been very difficult to do in genetics um, for both inherited and for cancer, um, somatic mutations, mainly because they're rare. And because they're rare disease, we cannot find many individuals with them. Or for example, with inherited, often it's a mutation found just in that family, or sometimes just in that individual if it's a new mutation. Some of these studies take a long duration and what do you do with individuals in the meantime? And so is it ethically valid to keep things into a study when there is enough evidence that there really needs to be um, be put into routine clinical um, care? And one of the problems in our genetics um, background is after all of this that the results are often inconclusive, either because they're poorly designed that we realize afterwards or that there are insufficient numbers involved. Now, the EGAP has been very useful in, in being able to pull together a lot of different um, studies and doing a meta-analysis, but a common conclusion from EGAP is that there is insufficient evidence. And so here is one of, um, uh, one of the conclusions for uh, the CYP450 testing for adults with SSRI treatment for non-psychotic depression. And so they say that discourages the use of this for, for this case until further clinical trials are completed. Unfortunately, that's sometimes taken as evidence against. And they take a narrow, you know, this was used for SSRI, and then um, blanketing it against others and saying, okay, it's not useful for anything. Um, and one of the challenges with this is that it says it's insufficient evidence, which means that it needs to be reevaluated with continuing studies. And truthfully, I don't know how often or how much these, these are um, really being able to, to be reevaluated. Um, there is one example of a 2C19 with a Plavix or clopidogrel that the initial studies uh, at first, they looked promising, then they didn't look so promising, and then we identified another common variant that was actually increasing um, the activity, uh, which was then com confounding the other variants, which was an explanation why those studies in between weren't able to replicate the initial ones. So now they're going back and by testing more alleles and when we know more about the mutations, the studies are coming back actually quite, um, quite favorably. But it becomes a circular pro um, problem if there is, if it's not, if there's lower evidence, it's poorly valued, it's not reimbursed, or we can't get funding, so we can't do clinical trials, so there's lower evidence. So how do we really break this circle. Um, I, I, was, um, I was pleased, you know, in working with, uh, with the Blue Cross Blue Shield, a BCBSA, uh, in looking at what, they, what their parameters were. And I think we're very much similar with the testing of symptomatic individuals, so diagnostic testing, and in my mind, I'm looking for something that will explain the clinical system symptoms. And if so, we can understand better the disease course. The prognosis then, um, it will help us understand the likely disease progression and to allow us to potentially do preventive man management. And then the therapeutic, which I would love to do, unfortunately in genetics we don't have an awfully lot of them, um, where we determine the most effective uh, therapy or treatment management. Also with an asymptomatic individual, so a person who doesn't have um, uh, symptoms, it can be done for predictive testing, and this is usually done for family history um, because there's a family history in it. Again, uh, it's 
so much better for us if we had test an affected family member first so we know what those family mu mutations are. And then we do do a number of these tests for population screening so um, to identify individuals, uh, identify newborns, and these do have treatments involved, and sometimes the treatment is diet. Uh, so if they can be controlled by diet, that is absolutely wonderful. So the testing somatic cancer cells, um, again, some of them could be used for diagnostic purposes, but more often they are for prognostic um, or predictive uh, purposes to determine aggressiveness of what the disease should be and therefore the treatment or um, the therapy or resistance to therapy. Our main difficulty is that the models for clinical studies just are not working very well for us. So the fully powered studies, they're not feasible. So how can we use some underpowered or partial data can we model them to provide useful information? So can we think of different ways to gain enough evidence, supportive or adequate evidence, um, by looking at chain of evidences, looking at biological relationships and pathways? Once we've identified a mutation that is important in, in one type of cancer, um, do we need to show it in all types of cancers, or can the bar be lower to show different um, specimen types um, that it's useful in other situations? For inherited diseases, there's approximately 4,600 known medically relevant genes right now. It's, I, it's just overwhelming to me to say, how do we show each disease separately? In my mind, once that that clinical validity has been established that this gene is mutations cause this disease. Um, it's very hard to not offer that to individuals um, when and, and try to do a clinical study for it. Um, there's another 20, you know, another 15,000 or more in the genome. Uh, many more may be shown to be medically relevant. I'm pretty much convinced we have not identified all of the medically relevant genes yet. Can we show the usefulness of these comparing the non-molecular diagnostic pathway to what we do with the molecular pathway? Um, and I think that, that may be one of the best ways to show um, this, the testing for this has utility. And then the other possible way is the diagnostic efficacy. And again, I've commented the same assay can be used for different purposes. So I just wanted to show briefly uh, the utility in, in oncology where we we're looking for driver mutations that are essential for tumor progression. We may be looking for passenger mutations that may, be, may facilitate. Um, these are mainly for prognosis and predictive therapy. And um, we did an exercise. I was on a working group with the Association from Electropathology uh, talking about clinical utility, and I will say many of these slides are coming from that discussion. Um, we went through this, and these are some Tier 1 CPT codes to say, okay, does this test, is this useful in the diagnosis or in the management, or is it prognosive or predictive? And as you can see for oncology, a few of them are important for the diagnosis, but most of them are for more of the management, prognosis, or predictive purposes. For inherited diseases, as I said, they're so rare, it's not feasible to show utility for each one. Is there a way that we could aggregate by disease, disease type or potentially by method type? And one of the things that um, our genetic counselor pointed out to me is that, it's, that there's still a struggle because even though they are rare, we may not have strong numbers to show this, but they do have a strong clinical validity, and identifying a mutation in this may be 
very important. And unfortunately, these don't have CPT, not all of them have CPT codes with them. They're kind of lumped all together into the 84179. So possibly one of the things that I would like to do is take this back and see if we can um, maybe start looking at CPT codes so they can be more transparent. One of the points, though, is that together these are very substan uh, substantive, that um, basically if you look long and hard enough, pretty much everybody has something that could be medically relevant in them or a family member. Uh, from a, an article in, in JAMA, it says 100% of individuals have genetic var variants that could affect drug response. So um, it is pretty daunting to think that, that this actually affects as many people in the population. In other words, everyone. So here are the same type of uh, Tier 1 um, CPT codes mainly for the genetic tests. And if you can see, most of them are actually for the diagnosis, and that is their main purpose. However, some of them um, can be specifically used for that management of that patient. A good portion of them can be used for prognosis as well, but many of them once we can diagnose an affected individual in the family, we can use it for a uh, pre-symptomatic and do it as a predictive test. So um, I think we only put one down that it was a limited for hereditary hemochromatosis, and that is because we have learned that these mutations are not highly penetrant. And so they, um, in this case, they would not have a very strong positive or uh, a negative Actually, this would be a positive predictive value. Here is an example that I used. Um, we're kind of a center of excellence for hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. It is still considered a rare disease, but it's not really that rare, um, probably one in about 20,000 individuals. And um, it has telangiectasias around the, the mouth and the fingers, but the life-threatening um, symptom is a cerebral or pulmonary um, arterial venous malformation. And so if that is present, um, that becomes really one of the hallmarks of the diagnosis and what, you need, what needs to be controlled. To look for this, they need to do a brain MRI um, with contrast or a contrast echocardiogram. And some of those will need, about 20% will need a follow-up with a, a chest CT, which then also increases radiation exposure. And you need to do this about every five years in affected individuals, or in unaffected individuals, you need to do it until they're at least age 40, because it's only at age 40 that you can completely rule out the disease, and these guidelines are available. So by having the molecular test available for this family, identifying it in an, a, a clearly affected individual, and then being able to identify the unaffected individuals that so they don't need to go through the surveillance is, um, is very useful. So uh, I know that the, a lot of the discussion, and, and we are very enthusiastic about some of our gene panels as well. And there was a uh, guidelines that came out from the American Society of Human Genetics that I will, that I wanted to share with you, um, where they said the scope of genetic testing should be limited to single gene analysis or targeted gene panels based on the clinical presentation of the patient. I took out that it said if clinically indicated, and so there's, um, they do recognize that there may be some times that you want to do an exome or a genome, but their point, which I do agree with, is that you use the most focused assay available as appropriate for the clinical symptoms. If it is a single gene and it meets the clinical criteria, you do the single gene. So for example, if a child is diagnosed with cystic fibrosis because of a two positive sweat chlorides, just sequence the CFTR gene, or you may want to start with the targeted gene panel. However, if there is a small gene panel with a few genes with overlapping phenotype, then that can improve the diagnostic yield, especially if it's a non-classic one. 
so the HHT that I just showed you, the um, hemorrhagic telangiectasia, uh, there's actually two major genes and one minor gene. So even that, and even though we do it as Sanger sequencing, that is still a small gene panel um, because we do need to look at both of those genes. Um, large gene panels, um, these would be looking at more common symptoms. And then the exomes would be if you, if this really looks like it's a, has a genetic etiology, but there's really no other symptoms or no other um, notes that you can look at. One of our gene panels is a Marfan syndrome. Um, and, well, I'm sorry, it's, we call it aortopathy, but overlapping with Marfan, Leostotes, um, Dietz, Erlos, Danlos. All of these have some symptoms in common. Um, one of the things they all have in common is um, sudden death in a close relative. If we do our single gene assay, and if, a, if an individual has a clinical diagnosis and meets all of the criteria for um, Marfan disease, then sequencing the single gene is completely appropriate. Um, we don't have a huge positivity rate because so many times we're getting a suspected pathogenic or a suspected diagnosis of Marfan. If you look at this, uh, from our positive patients, over half are ones that have a, tr a clear clinical phenotype. Less than half, then, is a suspected diagnosis. And we're picking up variants of uncertain um, significance for those with a suspected diagnosis. The question then is, are these truly, um, you know, they're uncertain, but they could be or could be maybe milder mutations showing a different phenotype or we may not have picked up what the, um, the, the cause of the symptoms are yet. So when we put together this small gene panel, and it's 17 genes, and each one of them has a separate clinical validity, we were able to pretty much double our um, detection rate and clinic um, of picking up the mutations. Just looking towards the future, uh, the exome, uh, if you're looking, one measure is the diagnostic yield, and overall it's at 25%, which isn't bad considering nobody else knows what is going on with these individuals. If you're only looking at severe intellectual disability, it drops to 16%. So it's not, um, it's not very effective for that criteria. However, if there are other neurological symptoms involved as well, uh, we're getting a very high, a 64%, which is, um, is quite remarkable. So just in conclusion, the current models may not be able to do everything for us. So obviously we do want randomized control studies or retrospective studies when necessary, but we need to adapt some of these clinical trials to be more specific for what we're looking at. Um, we could potentially evaluate diagnostic yield, use observational data, our linkage analysis to make sure the gene has validity, as well as there are some functional studies that, um, that we can show what these mutations are actually doing. Um, but we also need to understand the biological relationships and the pathways um, because we may not have direct evidence. And I would propose that we look at the current care versus a molecular diagnostic model to maybe evaluate the utility of it. And then one of the other things that I would very strongly promote is more professional input of reviewing the data, reviewing the information so that we can better practice guidelines. Mm -hmm. that, I want to thank AMT's committees that I've worked with, as well as our own internal genetics genomics group. Thank you.